possibly one of the largest JLC PCB boxes that you'll see. Let's have a little look inside. And so yes, this is the LED clock which you saw me do a video on earlier in the year. Although not quite, if you have a look here, this is the mini version. And if we zoom out slightly, you can see this one doesn't actually have the LED matrix on it. So when I finished producing the PCB files, the JLC PCB website wouldn't actually accept the files that I'd uploaded. It seemed to crash at the last minute, presumably because of all of the components that were on the board. So what I did was I quickly got rid of the matrix to see if that's what was causing the problem, managed to upload this one. So I did order this one, but we do have the one with the matrix coming now that that has been fixed. So this one is essentially the same. The power supply circuitry is very slightly modified. But other than that, um, the way that we drive the clock and the ESP32 code for getting the time off the internet is going to be the same. So you can see the top half is exactly the same. And so here's a closer look at the assembly. So you can see there's absolutely no problems that I can see with the soldering and the pick and place of all the LEDs seems to have worked really nicely. It didn't really cause any trouble when I actually ordered it. They um, saw that I had corrected all of the orientations to make things easier. Uh, and I did put markers on here for all of the diodes. So everything here looks okay. We've got the little tactile switches. This is what I used to indicate which way around the LEDs should go. And then we've got the power supply circuitry. So we've got some capacitors, the DC to DC converter, uh, a 5 volt regulator, and then also a 3.3 volt regulator. So that's the PCB. There's not actually a huge amount on here that I need to solder on manually after the event. So basically all we've got is the light sensor in the top corner, the ESP32, and then the header at the side here for programming, and also the terminal block to supply power. So what I have been doing in the meantime is playing around with one of these ESP32 development kits. So this one's the OLED Wi-Fi Kit 32. I think this one came from Banggood. It was pretty inexpensive. So it's got an ESP32, an antenna, some flash and a USB interface, and then the OLED on the front. And I did have a little play around in the Arduino environment, but I really didn't get along with it very well at all. So what I ended up doing is installing Eclipse and ESP IDF and learning how to program it basically in there. And it's quite a change from your standard microcontroller because the ESP32 is running free RTOS. And the whole operating system for driving things specifically that need quite a lot of uh, controlled timing is a little bit more challenging than I'd hoped really, but I think I've got it sort of working. So what we're gonna do is I'll just get these components on and we'll try it out. Now I did manage to get some of the ESP32s from LCSC, so you can buy the ESP32 Room 32, and they did have the Room 32D, but they went out of stock just as I was about to buy it. Uh, but I have bought some of those from Mauser as well. So I think I'll use these ones for this device, and then the slightly more capable ones for the one with the matrix, just in case we need the extra capability. And so jumping forward a little bit, here is the programmed clock, and it seems to be working really well. 21 o'clock on the 1st of April, and you can see that my watch is matching that. And I was really quite impressed with the functionality that is included with the ESP IDF toolset, because there's really not a great deal that you need to do in order to get the NTP time working. And we'll have a little look at the code very shortly. Uh, but I've been running this in my lab for about a week now alongside my GPS disciplined oscillator and the time is basically spot on. So you can't really visually see any difference between the seconds on here and the seconds on the GPS disciplined oscillator, which is brilliant. Um, it does draw about 10 watts peak. So in maximum sunlight, this does go really quite bright. I'm not sure it's showing up on camera that well, but if I shine some light on the light sensor, this is visually really, really very bright. And then similarly, if we cover over the light sensor, we should get the LEDs dimming right down. There we go. And at night time, this is really quite a comfortable brightness to be able to read the time. So I'm really quite happy with how this is turning out so far. There are a few things that I still need to do on it, but let's have a little look at the code in Eclipse. So here we are in Eclipse IDE with ESP IDF installed. And all I did was 
create an Espressive IDF project, gave it a name, and then used one of the templates that's already included. So we can use the protocols and then SNTP, and this already does the majority of the NTP stuff that you'd need to do to get the time from the internet. So it's really nice that all of the N NTP stuff is basically included already in ESP IDF. You don't have to do a huge amount to get it working. First of all, you need to connect to Wi-Fi. At the moment, I'm just using the simple connection method where you put in the details in here. One thing I do need to do is have a little look at a better way to do that. And I did have a play around with a few different examples that I found on GitHub last night, whereby you can use your phone to connect to the device first, give it the details, and then it goes off and connects. So I might have a look at one of those. I think the most promising out the lot from there is one from the MIT, which seems to suit my needs the most. But if anyone has seen any or used any that work well, especially using Bluetooth would be a slightly nicer method so that you can always change the SSID and password. Uh, that would be really nice. So let me know if you've got any examples there. But in terms of getting the NTP clock working, once you've connected to Wi-Fi, all you have to do is set your time zone. So here is GMT and it's including summer time as well. So it automatically converts for you and use the function time zone set. And then you update the time and then uh, it's very simple then just to query the internet every so often to adjust the time. But otherwise the real time clock inside the ESP32 uh, keeps it going so that you don't have to query it every second. Now, one of the things that I did find when playing with the NTP servers is that when I was trying to call some of the servers from the NTP pool project, I often just didn't get any response. So even after sort of 30 seconds of trying, it didn't get any data. Then you try a few minutes later and it was absolutely fine. I found it a little bit flaky in that regard. What I've actually done just for now is to use the NTP server that's already on my PFSense router. So that already gets its time off one of the um, pool.ntp.org servers or somewhere else. And it seems pretty accurate. So at the moment, all I'm doing is just reading that from the router. And I always get a response from that with no problem. It also has this really nice feature here where if the time is out, it doesn't just suddenly update the clock with the new time and you suddenly see it jump. It's got this ability to smoothly change the time over a given period of time so you don't suddenly lose a second or whatever uh, because when it is running from the internal clock it probably does lose a couple of seconds per day. Now on that note in the configuration the operating system does actually allow you to choose how often to go and check the time. So I looked at previous examples and it looked like people were setting all kinds of timers to tell it to go and do all the updates. Actually it's all handled for you now so all you have to do is go into here at the moment, I'm telling it to check every 10 minutes. That's probably a little bit excessive, but it seems to work quite well, especially off my router. If you were pinging it off the internet, you might only want to do it a couple of times a day at the most. Uh, but that does work really well. And when I do a little trace on PFSense, you can see it pinging and just checking the time every 10 minutes. So it does seem to work. And like I said, the time has been spot on on this thing uh, for a week now. And then if you have a little look up here, here are our two tasks that we're creating to actually run the whole thing. So the first one is create task pinned to core and the calls are 0 and 1 and basically on core 1 I have all of the multiplexing stuff running on there and then ideally everything else running on the other core. So this one's creating a timer task and then on whichever core the operating system decides to run it on there's also another task which is reading the ADC and then updating the PWM value to control the brightness. Here is our little timer routine and this is the thing that caught me out. Basically you have to create the timer interrupt in a task that's running on the core that you want that interrupt to run on. So this task is running on core 1 and therefore when we create the timer that will also have the interrupt running on core 1. And here is our actual timer interrupt routine. Now it's a little bit longer than I would have liked, although actually in terms of time it doesn't take a great deal amount of time to run. Basically what it does is it goes and prepares all of the data to send out to the shift registers. So first of all it sends out the 24 bits to send out onto the three shift registers that are controlling all of the cathodes. And then it prepares the eight bits of data 
to choose which of the one of eight anode drivers it's going to run and then basically it goes through and sends all the data out on the SPI bus. The nice thing about using this operating system is it does include a lot of callbacks for the helper functions so every time it's done an SPI transaction we come into this little routine here and basically this is where we latch the data into the shift registers. So first of all we clear all of the shift registers on the display to make sure that the display is blank. Then we update all of the cathodes and latch those in and then finally we re-enable the anodes uh, depending on which one's being driven in this final function. And then once that's complete it then leaves the interrupt routine and waits until the next time that it needs to refresh to the display. So that's a little look at where I've got to so far with this clock project. What would be really useful is if anyone has come across a really nice example for setting the Wi-Fi details, preferably over Bluetooth, then if you could link it down below or give you some details that would be really useful because um, the ones that use the Wi-Fi do mean that you need to disassociate from the Wi-Fi that is currently connected to in order to update the details or well, that's been the case in the ones that I've seen so far. I'd much rather just be able to set the Wi-Fi details at any time without having to disassociate it from Wi-Fi. So if you've got any thoughts or comments leave them down below. What I am going to do Probably not just yet, but when I've got a little bit further with the firmware, this will all be uploaded onto the website so that you can uh, build your own if you want to or use the code for your own purposes. But hopefully you found the video useful, and until next time, thanks for watching.